Good evening, everybody. My name is Patricia Hoffer, and I'm the Chief Communications Officer here at St. Joseph's Healthcare London, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Doc Talks of 2020. Tonight is the first of the decade, the first one of today, of this year, and it is presented by CIBC and the Seabrook Financial Group at CIBC Wood Gundy. We host tonight's presentation in partnership with our foundation, as you know, and thanks to the work of the foundation and to the support of generosity and of our donors, um, we are able here at St. Joseph's to really focus on innovation and research and improving the lives of those that we care for. Tonight, Dr. Janet Pope is with us, and she is the head of rheumatology at St. Joseph's Hospital and a professor of medicine in the division of rheumatology at Western University's Schulich School of Medicine. So we're very grateful uh, to have you here with us this evening, and we're very grateful to have Dr. Pope here this evening. So please welcome me in joining her to the stage. So thank you very much. Um, if only when I talked to the med students, we had people come early, people being courteous, people being enthusiastic, but they pay a lot of tuition, so we gotta give them slack, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, true confessions, I am going to talk about RA, but because I do represent my division, and there is so much research in the other diseases that rheumatologists see going on here, I am going to flip from rheumatoid to psoriatic arthritis, to connective tissue diseases, to vasculitis, to osteoarthritis. And I'm going to do a format such as, what is it? How does it affect people living with the condition? And what are we doing about it and learning from uh, particularly the various supports that we've had here at St. Joe's? So again, I'd like to thank our sponsors here. These are my various A to Z um, uh, consultations that I do. Uh, there's my email. I do answer my email usually at around 11 p.m. because I don't have time by day, but I do answer it. Um, so first of all, uh, many people that come to Doc Talks probably don't know what a rheumatologist does. So if you have a rheumatic disease or a loved one, you do know, but most people don't. And in fact, many physicians don't exactly know what we do because we're sort of the, the rare disease as well as the common disease and the blood test abnormalities. And patients will come and say, why am I seeing you? I was told I have inflammation of blood vessels and you're an arthritis doctor. So we see an, an awful lot of autoimmune conditions. So acute or chronic diseases, usually the immune system attacking areas in your body. And lots of our diseases are multi-system. So joints is one small part of the thing of low blood or anemia, fatigue, inflammation of organs such as lungs and other things. So it's a little bit mysterious for many people. And then there's common diseases that we don't see so much of. Mechanical back pain, everybody here has probably had sciatica or other mechanical back or neck pain. Um, osteoarthritis of so the hips and knees, we can see it. We can't help it all that much. So if it's really severe, you might need an orthopedic surgeon for replacement. So from common osteoarthritis to more rare vasculitis and connective tissue disease, to things that are really quite common chronic diseases such as rheumatoid, which is one in 100. So it's a broad spectrum of things that we see and what we do. Okay. So rheumatoid arthritis, RA, I'm going to refer to it as. So it is one in 100 Canadians and it's actually increasing in age over time. So when I first started practice, the mean age of onset was about age 45. Now in our early arthritis clinic here, as well as the clinics throughout Canada, add 10 years. So the mean age of onset now is about 55 but people can still get it as kids, they can get it as young adults, they can get it after a baby, that's a risk factor postpartum when your immune system changes, you have immune tolerance while pregnant, and you can get it when you're 80 or 90. So it has really dramatically changed as the face of Canadians has changed. So who gets it? 
one in a hundred people living in Canada. If you look at the very elderly, the people over the age of 80, it's probably now three in a hundred. So in the elderly, it's surging upward and we don't exactly know why. They're, they're breaking through immune tolerance older now. It doesn't, we don't understand, it's a mystery. It's also more common in women, so it's about 70-30 or 80-20. So for every seven or eight women, there's three men approximately. So it is more common in women, and I'll tell you when a disease isn't, because we're almost everything we'll talk about of the autoimmune uh, rheumatology problems are more common in women. Okay, how do people feel living with rheumatoid arthritis? So they can have swollen joints, which can give stiffness, taking a long time to get loosened up in the morning. When you rest again or you're inactive, it can take time to get in motion again. So stiffness, joint pain, joint swelling, fatigue, it can make you sometimes have other conditions with it, such as, I talked to someone earlier, Sjogren's syndrome, so autoimmune dry eyes, dry mouth. Sometimes it has very low blood or anemia, so you can be tired and from that. It can affect a lot of things. And then I'm gonna talk about what we're doing about it. So that's the way we'll sort of uh, run this in each disease I talk about. So in rheumatoid arthritis, you can have rheumatoid nodules in your lungs. You could also have scarring on the lungs or interstitial lung disease. So some of my patients with RA have oxygen because they have inflammation and scarring on their lungs. You can see it can malalign fingers. So you can see the fingers are curved here. They're no longer articulating straight, but like a little ski hill, hill so they're subluxed. So you can't make a fist right. You can't do up buttons right necessarily, opening jars or zippers, uh, doing up your kids' shoes. So you can have a lot of frustration in getting dressed or doing cutting and chopping vegetables in your activities of daily living. This is some, a patient of mine with more damage, so more damage where she can't hold her hand out straight, it is malaligned. Here's an x-ray of a lot of damage. So it looks like basically someone put an eraser and rubbed out all these areas and uh, there's erosions or joint damage. And once we have joint damage, we can't reverse that. So we can reverse inflammation, we can't reverse damage. And the biggest risk of damage is uncontrolled inflammation and a bit of damage will be get more damage over time often worse on the dominant side because you use it more so it has more chance of getting malaligned. Uh, this is a patient with rheumatoid nodules so you can have lumps from your rheumatoid arthritis which is actually an inflammation of blood vessels. It's actually a vasculitis uh, because of the rheumatoid arthritis. And then this is one of my patients with severe damage who's had rheumatoid arthritis all her adult life. And, um, very difficult for her to function. However, she has an excellent attitude and comes to clinic and still holds a pen to write out her forms that we have her do. Um, so this is just showing that we are projected increase in Canadians. So you can see it can affect even children. It would be rare under the age of 10 and it's actually rare under menarche. So I do diagnose teens every year with rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes a weird infection like mono sets off an autoimmune connective tissue disease, or in this case, an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid. But the most common reason to get rheumatoid is, I don't know, you have the wrong genetics and you got bad luck. So it's usually something environmentally, whether it's an infection or other things that sets it off. We've done research in our early arthritis cohort and found that a major life stressful event increases the chance of getting rheumatoid arthritis two or three fold. So stress can change your immune system. I'm sure we're all aware of that if we get run down and things, but major stress can do it. So you see here, and this is I was alluding to, that in 2010, it was 1% of the population. In the elderly, we're seeing by the projection of 2040 that it'll be many elderly people will get rheumatoid arthritis. 
why it's increasing in particular in that age group, I don't know, and why it's shifting this way more, so the mean age of onset, it might be shifting because our population has changed. So even in lupus, the mean age of onset is about eight years older than when I first started practice. So maybe as Canadians um, become older as a population, uh, the age of onset shifts as well. It's difficult to say. Okay, so treating rheumatoid arthritis is really important. So our goals in early disease are to aim for remission. We want people to have very little pain and suffering. We want to prevent damage before it starts or stop damage once it's started. So we treat with very effective drugs and many people will go into remission. Not all, and certainly many people don't stay in remission because their immune system is very smart and figures it out. It's like getting drug resistance, the way people can get resistance if they were on, say, an antibiotic for uh, pneumonia. Sometimes there's drug resistance. Some of our immune systems will figure out, oh, that drug won't work anymore. I figured out how to circumvent it. So there's more chance of remission if treated early. So one of our major research foci here at St. Joe's is early inflammatory arthritis, early identification, so getting patients in earlier. And someone told me before we started that their loved one had to go to Toronto because they couldn't get in early enough here. So hopefully that won't happen anymore. If you have suspected rheumatoid arthritis, we all treat that like an urgency or emergency and save slots and get people in. Because if we pick up people in the first three months from when they have pain, stiffness, and swelling in their hands and feet, we can put two-thirds in remission. If we pick them up at a year and they haven't been treated in that first year, we can put one-third in remission. So the odds are really stacked for picking up people early. So early rheumatoid arthritis clinics allow us to facilitate earlier care. And we do do research that I'll tell you about. And then we can help screening patients in early uh, arthritis clinics. So I have a clinical nurse specialist, Julie Todd, that runs the CATCH, our Canadian Early Arthritis Clinic with me. And she sees patients and it is a really good cookbook that we use, so to speak, of treating people effectively early with a cocktail of medications because again our chance of remission is a lot higher if we use methotrexate in combination with other medications. It's never too late to try treatment though so that at every stage of the disease treatment can make a difference and um, we're kind of like the um, every time there's a new drug on TV probably half of them are in rheumatology right now, particularly in RA. So there's a lot of new molecules and I'll talk a bit about that. We target remission and uh, we know that lifestyle can affect outcome. So most times people did nothing to get RA. They didn't do anything, it wasn't a bad habit, it wasn't um, you know, something like, oh, I smoked a lot or I didn't eat well or I had way too much stress. The most common reason to get rheumatoid, as I mentioned earlier, is we don't know. You have the wrong genetics. 20% of people are at genetic risk of HLA-DR4 in Canada, but only one in the, of, of each of those 20 will get rheumatoid arthritis. So people live with rheumatoid arthritis and have these symptoms, pain, stiffness, fatigue, they flare so they feel good and then they say, I didn't do anything differently, I was exercising, I was treating myself fairly, I was going to bed right, I was eating right, and now I woke up and I have this big flare. Or it's really terrible weather outside and I'm stiff and sore. And it's not I'm just sad like everyone else because I don't see the sun, but I'm stiff and sore because that humidity or the change in barometric uh, pressure is sensed in your joints when they're inflamed. Same way people with migraines know that the weather's changing, they might get a migraine trigger. Some of our patients when the barometric pressure changes and it's damper will flare. And then people have problems doing even regular activities. 
um, opening up a jar that hasn't been opened, um, trying to uh, carry your groceries in when your hands are stiff and sore, walking the dog, babysitting the grandkid. All those things can be problematic sometimes, but not all the time. It really depends on how you live with it and what's happening, is it active? And also patients, people living with RA can get chronic pain. So chronic widespread pain is very common in rheumatoid arthritis and was underappreciated for decades. Now we've done publications on that and we know it's true. Okay, so what are we doing about it? So at St. Joe's, there are an awful lot of projects going on. So we have our early rheumatoid arthritis cohort study, and some of you in the room might have heard of that. So CATCH is Canadian Early Arthritis. So it's suspected or proven rheumatoid arthritis with one year of symptoms or less. We have about 4,000 Canadians in this uh, study, and we have about um, 420 here at St. Joe's. So lots and lots of patients. Some patients have already been followed 14 years out. So we've learned a lot from that. We have our Ontario registry, which is the Ontario Best Practice Research Initiative. So that's anyone with rheumatoid arthritis with one or more swollen joints, where we're going to consider changing treatment, is eligible to go in that study. And it's a neat one because there's phone calls that occur in parallel with doctor's visits. So the patients are set up for phone calls and we have found as a for instance that the doctor doesn't know a lot about what's going on. So we find out on the phone calls that people have had a serious infection in between appointments. Maybe they've had surgery. Maybe they've had a new diagnosis of high blood pressure because comorbidities like high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, a lot of these other chronic diseases are increased in people with rheumatoid arthritis. So we don't always know that. So we find out some of these things by the phone calls. Then we're also doing pragmatic trials, which are real world randomized control trials with very little effort for the patient. We don't want people to come over and over like a double blind trial, which we do as well. And in these pragmatic trials, what we do are we're trying to have an easy question with an easy answer. So the current one going on right now is if your rheumatoid arthritis is still active and you've been through our methotrexate kind of drugs, our traditional disease modifying drugs, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, leflunamide, drugs like that, and you would be eligible to move to an advanced therapy because you still have active disease and you meet criteria to get it. We're randomizing patients to the TNF biologics that are commonly used or an oral group of drugs, the JAK inhibitors. And so it's not, which do you want? It's, hey, if you're willing to come in the study, it's a 50-50 uh, uh, randomization. And all those drugs would be of equal access for people living with rheumatoid arthritis. That's why we're comparing the two classes of drugs. And our question is easy. Are you still on the drug at 18 months or not? Because the drugs are uh, two classes, very highly effective. Uh, but we don't know if one will be more of a home run. And because we're treating people for decades, not weeks and months and years, and because so many drugs at year one work well, at year two not so well, and at year five you might but not be on them anymore, so many drugs become resistant over time. Our first question of the pragmatic trial is one more durable, you're still on it, because if you're on it, it probably works and it's probably tolerated. So it's effective and it's well tolerated and safe. So that's one of our questions. So these are just some of our research. Um, we have loads of students, so we run um, summer studentships that are clinical, which is great to turn young medical students onto uh, rheumatology so they see what it is. But we also have studentships that are research, so we often have medical students doing outcomes research. What does this health assessment questionnaire mean? What changes fatigue in people? When you flare, how much does it take to change before you're going to call in and say you're flaring? We answer all sorts of clinical questions that are relevant to you, particularly with the students. 
So here's data from our catch cohort. So the cool thing is every few years, 2007, 2008, et cetera, and up here we were looking at some of the higher years and following for a year or two, every year we've been following people with early inflammatory arthritis, more of them are likely to go into remission. And these remission graphs, there's nothing like it in the US or Europe where they have early arthritis clinics. Our rates of remission are far higher and we think it's because we use more effective doses of methotrexate, because we use more combination therapies, because we're all trying to see people earlier, because if you see people earlier, more will go in remission. And you can see here, this is remission by one way and remission by another definition. So it is good news that more people go into remission. And I always say to people who come into these research studies, they do homework every visit. It's not too much to do, They're, I'm behind anyway, so they do the work while they're waiting for myself and Julie, my nurse. But what I can say is I'm a better doctor because of this cohort, because we're doing better, and we must be doing better for a reason because we've learned from our past. What we do know is that women have a little bit less remission than men, even though there's more women uh, in the cohort. And if they're overweight, they have less remission. If they have more tender joints, as a for instance, more uh, less remission. If they haven't used methotrexate, the gold standard, because of intolerability, less remission. And for men, smoking and being overweight decrease the chance of remission. So in women and men, the risks of remission are a little bit different, but some of these things are treatable. So Taylor, our pharmacist, is running smoking cessation programs for anyone in our clinic, as well as some of the other chronic uh, disease clinics, because we're trying to change that. We wonder if smoking changes how a drug is broken down or metabolized. So there might be a reason why smoking decreases remission. Um, it's hard to say. We also know comorbidities, all these other medical conditions. People don't come in just with rheumatoid. They might have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, heart disease, asthma, things like that. We know that if you have no baseline comorbidity, 60% are in remission at a year versus about opposite that, 40% if you have one or more comorbidities. We know your function is worse, zero is the best, if you have comorbidities, and we know your pain is higher, it's out of 10, so one out of 10 average pain, and after a year for our RA patients with no comorbidities, and almost three out of 10. So comorbidities affect the chance of doing well, and we don't think it's just polypharmacy. We think there's interactions at the immune system level between one kind of chronic disease and another. We also know that there's more obstructive lung disease and interstitial lung disease, so emphysema as well as other lung disease in people living with rheumatoid arthritis. So we know a lot now. Then this is looking at what about fatigue? So patients will say to me, and this is why we did this research, okay, Dr. Pope, you said I'd be a lot better and you're telling me I'm a lot better, but to be quite honest, I still feel crappy. I'm super tired, my pain is like 4 out of 10, and my fatigue is 4 out of 10, and before I ever came to you, it was 0 out of 10. I didn't have RA, I felt good. So I do feel really crappy. So I had a question of our established RA patients, and the question was as follows. Once you get in remission, and remission meaning I don't see any swollen joints, your disease activity and inflammation is good, how long does it take your fatigue to lag behind and be as good as it's going to get? Because I did want to tell people, you know what, in X months on average you might be a lot better, or you know, suck it up, you got to deal with the fatigue in another way because I can't treat it anymore. So I needed to answer the question. So it was patients that driv drove that question. So there's different times, so we can get people into um, uh, p low pain, we can get s two thirds of people into low pain, but what happens here is if you look at, these are all these fancy remission scores, so on average it takes you 40 months to go into remission from first visit with active disease if you're not a new RA patient. You came out of remission, you're having a rough go. Some people never get to remission, some people get to remission in a month. It's highly variable. but. 
fatigue takes, you know, there's another year in there. 39 months to 55 months, it takes a lot longer. So this is showing time to your first zero swollen joint count and your fatigue and pain, not as many people get as good and it lags behind, it's shifted over this way and it's lagging behind by months. So what I can say to people, there's still hope. And I think when you have something that gives your brain a lot of pain, you say have 12 swollen joints, your brain map is very sensitized to pain and to fatigue. You don't sleep right. And when we get that inflammation gone, it takes time to get back into better sleep, down regulating that pain and that fatigue. So again, I think there's hope. I can say that although you feel way better or, and you're not, you still have a lot of fatigue and I see you're even better than you're saying you are, at some point we're gonna be more concordant because it will take a lot of sleep deprivation time to actually get that sleep good again. So it's just one example of the study that we have done um, here at St. Joe's. And then um, looking here, this is a study we wanted to look at quality of life trajectories. We've done lots of quality of life studies. And I'm putting this up here, not for bragging rights, but for people that do these cohorts, they realize that at least we are using their data. So in our CATCH cohort, I searched it a couple days ago, we have 30 uh, peer reviewed publications that came out of St. Joe's. They're all, we like I'm on other publications as well, but 30 publications where I'm actually a better doctor for learning it. Then if we look at uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I do a lot of publications in rheumatoid arthritis. So 158, and this was a nice review that was done for Lancet, which is our highest level journal really in, um, in Europe. And it was a nice review on rheumatoid arthritis. And again, you get asked to do things like this because of the fact that I publish and because at St. Joe's we have lots of funding to help us learn more for our patients. That's the pragmatic trial that I looked at. So this is still underway. And the idea is once we have a springboard for easy real world questions by randomizing people to two equal available pathways, two really good ideas or treatment options, then we can do it in psoriatic arthritis. We can do it as next line therapy in RA. We can do it in lupus. We can do it in ankylosing spondylitis. And I can make my peers or strongly encourage them uh, in Ontario to do it through the electronic medical record with appropriate consent and all that. So this is a springboard to really say the legacy of St. Joe's might be that we actually can help the government to tier drugs because right now drugs are only tiered by cost, not by effectiveness. They're all pretty effective when we get into these expensive biologicals and JAK inhibitors, but they're tiered in general by cost. But maybe we could do a better idea and tier it by what is more effective in more people. Thank you very much, Dr. Pope. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Averro. I'm on the board of directors of uh, St. Joseph's Health Healthcare Foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pope tonight for insights into rheumatoid and the other diseases she spoke about. There's been many advancements that Dr. Pope spoke about tonight. Um, who knows where we'll be in 5, 10, 15 years. But it is key that the donors in this room and the donors in the community really help to fund this research and to keep us at the forefront of this. So uh, with that, uh, Patricia, I don't know if she's still here, but she spoke about how we're in our third season of Doc Talks. So as you know, we have a packed room tonight. The next session is March 11th, and it's Dr. Scheidau and he will be discussing the risks of eye disease as well as prevention strategies and current treatment options available for individuals with living with diabetes. Registration opens February 11th. Get in fast, there's always a waiting list. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank our corporate sponsors, CIBC and the Seabrook Financial Group at CIBC Wood Gundy for making tonight possible. And I would like to thank all of you and all of the individual donors in the community uh, for making all the medical innovation possible and for allowing us to be at the forefront. Thank you everyone and have a great night.